Hello, uh, we're going to be covering chapter 37, Transport Operations. Uh, we're going to uh, be discussing uh, ambulances, um, what some things are stock, uh, excuse me, some of the things that are stocked in ambulances. Um, we're going to be discussing some of the technology. Um, we're going to be talking about um, the emphasis on rapid response um, that, that places the EMTs in greater danger. So let's talk about some emergency vehicle design um, to start out with here. Um, an ambulance is a, a vehicle that's used for treating and transporting patients who are uh, in need of emergency medical care uh, to a hospital. Ambulances are also used for transport from hospitals to hospitals and then hospitals to um, other facilities such as uh, long-term care facilities, um, dialysis centers, those types of things. Uh, ambulances are designed based on NFPA, which is National Fire Protection Agency, um, code 1917, which is the standard for automotive ambulances. So there is a standard um, that's set, and then the state of Ohio has uh, its own set of standards um, that are followed uh, through the Department of Public Safety um, that are, are requirements for ambulances and, and how they're designed. So just some um, basic topics here of emergency vehicle design. Um, most commonly now you see enlarged patient compartments, um, and we'll talk about the different styles of ambulances, but in the past, you know, I'm sure you've seen pictures, older pictures of, of smaller ambulances, ambulances in, in um, you know, as far back as, as old Cadillacs, uh, and then in, in smaller vans. Now we're seeing most ambulances that have these large box-like um, enlarged patient compartments. First responder vehicles have personnel and equipment um, to treat patients until an ambulance can arrive. So what they're talking about there is first responders uh, vehicles may be, um, uh, you know, like an EMS supervisor in, a, in, a, uh, in an SUV or a car or uh, a fire engine, for example. So some cities respond, um, city fire departments respond as first responders for uh, the ambulance. And so they'll send out an engine company or a ladder company prior to the ambulance arriving um, to perform some first aid to establish, you know, the scene and, and figure out what's going on prior to that ambulance arriving. Um, that's what a first responder vehicle is. Some different components of a modern ambulance. Obviously, the driver's compartment. Uh, we'll talk about um, some different things to, to be aware of uh, with the driver's compartment, the patient compartment. Uh, patient compartment must now be big enough for uh, two EMTs or paramedics and two um, supine patients. So um, ambulances are required to be able to carry two patients in the supine uh, or lying flat position. So most ambulances that you'll see now have obviously the place for the uh, patient cot. And then next to that, you'll see a long bench seat. And that bench seat is used as the second place to place, uh, second you know position to place a patient in um, should the need arise for your ambulance to take two patients to the hospital. Um, some common uh, cases or common runs that you're going to go on where you may have to take two patients, uh, mass casualty incidents, um, motor vehicle collisions where there's multiple victims. A lot of times we'll take two family members if they're both stable, relatively stable. We'll take two family members in the same ambulance um, just to better utilize our, re our resources and then keep those family members together. Um, you'll have, obviously, equipment and supplies, which we'll talk about, um, radio communications. Um, and nowadays, you see ambulances being designed um, for maximum safety and comfort. So there's a lot of safety features that have come out in ambulances recently. There's different um, uh, systems in the back that can allow um, the, the EMTs to be restrained. Um, there's, there's systems in the boxes now that have airbags. Um, which, which is relatively new to actually have airbags in the back in the patient compartment. Um, so these things are, are, are making um, our, our trips to the hospital a whole lot safer. All right, so some different uh, basic ambulance design. There's three types of ambulances. Um, be aware of these. I have seen questions, uh, National Registry questions, relating to the different types of ambulances. Um, so this is something to um, uh, commit to, to your memory for now. Um, type 1 ambulances are uh, conventional ambulances. This is the most common ambulance that you're going to see. It's a truck uh, cab chassis with a modular ambulance body, which is the box as we refer it to it. Um, and that, that box can be transferred to different chassis as needed. So 
Uh, if the chassis itself, if the motor goes bad one day, they can pick that box up and put it on a new chassis. That's a, a type one ambulance. Um, again, these are what you. This is what you most commonly see uh, out on the street. Um, type two ambulances are uh, standard vans. So this is a full van, and, and I've got pictures here on the next slide, uh, next couple slides here to show you uh, the different types. But type two is a standard van, um, forward control integral, integral cab body ambulance. So it's all one piece, right? It's it's the cab, the body, it's all connected, it's all interconnected. Um, these are smaller, not as much space to work. You do see these from time to time. You do see these some uh, some private ambulance companies uh, run with some vans. Um, they typically use those vans for less serious, more just patient transport, uh, transporting patients to doctor's offices, to dialysis appointments, those kind of things, versus actual emergency run uh, type vehicles. Those you're going to see type one or type threes. Type threes are very similar to type one, except instead of the chassis being a truck cab, it's actually the van cab um, with that modular ambulance body or box that's mounted on the back of the chassis. Um, ambulance licensing uh, or certification standards are established by the state. So the state of Ohio has its own licensing um, uh, procedure for ambulances. Basically, what this means is you, you can't just um, buy a van or buy a, a, an ambulance, you know, uh, at an auction or something, slap a star of life on it and call yourself an ambulance. That's not how it works. You have to be licensed by the state of Ohio um, and follow all of their standards. They, they will send any new ambulance that's put into service. The state will actually send an inspector out to inspect the ambulance to ensure um, that it, it meets all the qualifications. All right, so uh, different types of ambulances. This one up here in the upper left, this is a type one. That is a truck chassis with that modular uh, box or body on the back. This is a type two upper right here is a type two ambulance. This is that integral uh, integrated van. Um, it's all uh, interconnected, um, the patient compartment and the cab. And then this down here is, I know it's not a real great picture, but this down here is a type three ambulance, which is the van cab with the modular box on the back. So you can see here in the front, the cab, it's basically this portion of the van, the, the, cha the, the uh, driver's compartment and the chassis. And then they've placed one of these modular boxes uh, or, or patient body compartments uh, on the back of that chassis. All right, so um, this next section of the slideshow, we're going to go through the phases of an ambulance call. So I, we're going to go through each phase, and, and all, we're not talking about um, treating patients, and we're not talking about different, um, you know, medical, um, you know, problems, medical issues, emergencies that, that you're going to arise. We're not talking about specific things here. We're talking about very broad um, uh, phases, and we're talking about uh, what you're doing in, as, as it pertains to um, the, the ambulance, the procedure, and those types of things. So these are the different um, general phases of an ambulance call. Um, pre uh, preparation for the call, so this is when you arrive at work, right? When you first get uh, to work, you're preparing for your first call because you don't know how soon that could happen. It can happen one minute into your shift, you know, it could happen... 10 hours into your shift, but you need to be prepared from the get-go. So the preparation of the call, that's when you arrive to work, and that's prior to the call. We're going to talk about the dispatch. Um, we're going to talk about different things to think about while you're en route to the call, different things to think about when you're arrived at the scene of the call. We're going to talk about transferring the patient into the ambulance, and then we're going to talk about uh, en route to the, to the receiving facility uh, or otherwise known as transport. Then we're going to talk about uh, when you arrive at that receiving facility or the hospital, and that's delivery of your patient. Then we'll talk about uh, en route to the station. So leaving that facility, going back to your station, um, and then post run being everything that happens after um, you've completed this run. Uh, so clean up and those types of things. So we'll start out with the preparation phase. Um, one of the key elements of the preparation phase, one of the key elements that you want to think about when you arrive to work is making sure that your equipment and supplies are in their proper places and ready for use. 
your equipment and your supplies, those are all your tools, right? Those are your tools. You can't do your job without your tools. You need to make sure that your tools are available, that they're in the right place, they're ready for use. If you've got items missing, items that don't work, um, they are of no use to you or the patient, so you need to get those things remedied um, immediately. So if you find something that's, that's improper, something that's not working, something that's missing, it needs to be reported and replaced um, as soon as you possibly can. Um, store new equipment only after proper instructions on its use um, and consulting with the medical director. So if you were to um, find um, you know, a new piece of equipment, a new item that you want to keep on your ambulance, you need to consult with your medical director and you need to have proper education on the instruction uh, or excuse me, proper instruction on the on the use of uh, that device. Um, equipment should be durable and standardized. So uh, if you're working um, with a fleet, you're working uh, for a fire department that has multiple ambulances or a private ambulance company, obviously with multiple ambulances, the equipment should be standardized amongst the different vehicles so that in the event you have to get moved due to staffing issues, due to maintenance issues, you have to get moved to a different ambulance. It's all standard. You know exactly where to find everything. You're not having to look um, at different places and try to find the equipment that you need. Store equipment and supplies according to how urgently and how often they are used. Um, so items for life-threatening conditions should be at the head of the primary stretcher. Um, what they talk of, what they're talking about here is you have to imagine yourself uh, on the way to the hospital um, with a patient who crashes in the back, right? So you got a patient who goes into cardiac arrest, um, and you've got two EMTs in the back. You need to ensure that uh, you have equipment uh, necessary to uh, to work a cardiac arrest, um, you know, within arm's reach of where you're at. So the th the things that we don't use very frequently, um, the the CAD board, the you know the KED, the um, you know, there's different items that that we don't use as frequently. Some bandaging equipment, those kind of things, those can be moved towards compartments where uh, you know they're maybe a little bit further away from you. The compartments right next to the seat, right next to where you're sitting, those need to be filled with the items that you need in the event of a patient having a problem with their ABCs. So bag valve mass devices, um, your airways, OPAs, MPAs, um, eye gels, King Airway, those types of things need to be re uh, right there very close. The AED needs to be within arm's reach, those types of things. Cabinets uh, and drawer fronts should be transparent um, or labeled. So if they're not transparent, they need to be properly labeled so that in the event you, you're in a high stress type environment, in the event that you need a piece of equipment, you want to be able to look over and either see that equipment or see a label with that equipment's name. Even if you know exactly where that stuff's at, um, it's still a good idea to have labels and, and ideally transparent um, uh, openings um, so that you can see the equipment itself. Um, so we'll uh, talk about some different medical equipment here, basic supplies, um, you, you know, you, you've got airway and ventilation equipment, your CPR equipment, basic wound care supplies. These are all your minimums, right? So this is the minimum equipment that needs to be in your, in your ambulance. Um, splinting supplies, uh, so things like uh, backboard, um, board splints, traction splints, those types of things. Um, one of the things you're going to... Uh, you're going to see, but it wouldn't be considered a minimum supplies it would be like a Stokes basket, um, rescue equipment, those kind of things. Um, but uh, again, continuing on with the minimum equipment, you would need childbirth supplies, uh, usually comes in a OB kit, a full kit has all of the childbirth supplies that are needed. Um, automated external defibrillator, patient transfer equipment. So your cot sheets, uh, patient movers, uh, which are big tarps with handles on them, um, and certainly any sort of medications that you need, um, and then a jump kit. And a jump kit uh, is is uh, uh, basically a bag uh, that's filled with the necessities for the first five minutes of your run. So the first five minutes that you're uh, that you're on that run, you can use that jump bag uh, or jump kit. We call it in in, uh, uh, in Central Ohio. Most people call it a, like a first in kit. Um, the first in bag, um, and, and that just has, uh, you know, your, your vital signs equipment, so your blood pressure cuff, your pulse oximeter, it's got trauma shears, 
you're going to have a BVM, a bag valve mask device. Uh, you may have some oral airways. You'll have a tourniquet in there. You'll have some gloves, some you know minor bandaging equipment, just all of those things that you would need in those first five minutes to, to save somebody's life. Um, and the purpose of that jump kit is is it's a it's a light, quick bag for the the in charge EMT to to go into the scene with first, um, prior to you know the your teammates gathering up the rest of the equipment that you may need. Some different safety and operations operational equipment. Um, you certainly need personal safety equipment, um, traffic vests, um, road flares, cones, those kind of things. Uh, equipment for your work area that you may need, um, certainly all important. Flashlights. Um, Pre-planning and navigation equipment, so having not only a, a, a GPS device, but a hard map in case GPS device stops working. Um, so having those that pre-planning and navigation equipment is important. Um, extrication equipment, this is not something that we see uh, typically around, uh, around Central Ohio area. Uh, to have extrication equipment on, on ambulances, but it, it is possible. You may go work somewhere that's more remote area um, that does have some, some minor extrication equipment um, on board the, the ambulance. All right, so as far as personnel goes, at least one EMT in the patient compartment during transport. Um, that's a state requirement. The state requires one EMT to be in the patient uh, compartment uh, during transport. Um, two EMTs are strongly recommended. Uh, certainly, uh, if you work in a paramedic system, you're going to have paramedics um, available as well. Um, some services have a non-EMT driver and a single EMT in the patient compartment. The state of Ohio requires uh, a medically uh, two medically trained people uh, to operate an ambulance. So the driver has to be a first responder or an EMT. I'm um, still talking about the prep phase here, perform daily inspections. So your, your ambulance needs inspected. You need to inspect the cleanliness, the quantity, function of medical equipment and supplies. And again, this is this is the first thing that you should do uh, when you arrive at your at your work location. Oops, excuse me. Um, review safety precautions. So good idea to just review some traffic safety rules. Um, review any sort of road closures that are happening in your in your uh, response district. Um, ensure that the safety devices are in working order, the lights, make sure your lights are working, headlights, emergency lights, your siren, those kind of things. Properly secure your oxygen tanks and ensure that you have oxygen in the tanks. Um, and then properly secure all the equipment in the cab and the rear compartments. One of the things that people don't think about a lot is um, if you are involved in an auto accident, you may be seat belted. Uh, but if you've got equipment that's in, unsecured in the cab or in the patient compartment, um, such as your cardiac monitor, um, that thing's going to become a missile uh, during an auto accident. So everything needs to be um, secured uh, to, to the best of your ability. All right, so we're moving on to the dispatch phase. I'll talk about dispatch a little bit here. Dispatch uh, must be easy to access and in service 24 hours a day. Um, this may be operated by uh, local EMS or by a shared service. So for example, in, in central Ohio, um, Columbus um, dispatches for most um, fire departments in the in Central Ohio, and most EMS departments. Um, some EMS departments have their own dispatching, and then private ambulances have their own dispatchers as well. So, uh, depending on who you work for and where you work, uh, you will um, you have to just be familiar with your dispatchers and your uh, the system that they have in place. Um, the dispatcher is going to gather, and they should gather um, and record the nature of the call, the name, the location, and the callback number, the location of the patient, the number of patients and the severity of their conditions, and then other pertinent information. As far as that dispatch information, the most important information that you're going to get out of all of that is the location of the patient. Um, if you don't know where the patient's at, you can't do anything else. So knowing the location of the patient is the most important information that they're going to give you. Everything else is obviously important, um, but if we can't get to the patient, that's going to hinder us from doing anything with them. So location of the patient, most important. All right, so en route to the scene, so you dispatch. Now we're going to talk about this phase of being en route to the scene. This is the most dangerous phase for EMTs. More EMTs die in auto accidents than in any other case. So um, crashes, auto accidents cause serious injuries and death. Um, ensure that you're always wearing your seatbelt with a shoulder harness before moving the ambulance. So everybody needs buckled in um, before you even start moving. 
review the dispatch information, prepare to assess and care for the patient. So I know that I've talked about it in the past, but your size up of the scene starts, um, you know, with the dispatch and even before you're going through different possible scenarios in your head. So as soon as you get that dispatch information, you start to find out the location of the patient, uh, what was told during the 911 call, those kind of things, all that dispatch information, you're starting to gather that information in your head and get an idea of, um, of what potential care is going to be needed for, for that patient. It's kind of getting a game plan, right? Getting a game plan together. All right, once you arrive at the scene, so we'll talk about the arrival at the scene phase. Um, you're going to perform a, a, a scene size up and report your findings as dispatch. So this doesn't, uh, re reporting those findings to dispatch on, a, on an EMS run, that doesn't typically happen in, in central Ohio. Um, and that's, I don't think that's very common. Um, but it's a possibility that you would have to report at least that you found the patient um, to dispatch. Um, look for safety hazards. Evaluate the need for additional units. That's also important. If you arrive on scene and you see that you've got multiple victims, let's say it's an automobile accident, you've got four or five victims, um, you're going to need to, to quickly call for additional units. Um, determine the mechanism of injury, nature of illness. We talked extensively about that uh, in the past. Um, evaluate the need for spinal mobilization and then follow all your, your standard uh, uh, PPE precautions. So make sure you've got your gloves on and, and any other PPE that you may need. As far as mass casualty incidents, if you do arrive first at the scene of a mass casualty incident, um, the most important thing you're going to do is uh, initially set up a good incident command uh, uh, structure. So you're going to have to become uh, an incident commander. You're going to have to be in charge of this incident for the first few minutes here. And one of your uh, most critical tasks at that point is determining uh, what help that you need, what additional units that you need. So if you arrive on scene at first and you're getting reports that there's, you know, 50 people down, you're going to have to request, a, a, you know, additional help very quickly in that in that particular case. Um, this is that um, FEMA NIM stuff that you took. This all applies here. So um, certainly review some of those uh, some of those, uh, you know, major bullet points. Um, the incident command system is going to have to be established as a first arriving ambulance. You're not going to do much more than establish it um, and then and then get to work after that. Safe parking. So when you arrive at the scene, it's in, in, important to um, park in the right place, uh, park safely, um, certainly allow efficient traffic flow and control around an emergency scene. So if you're arriving on scene somewhere and, and it's a it's a, uh, you know, a patient's inside their house, you know, there's no need for you to uh, block an entire road or block a good portion of a roadway uh, while you, when you're going inside to somebody's house, right? So if it's not an automobile accident, um, you blocking an entire roadway is probably not going to be helpful um, to you or to the to the traffic flow. So if you're causing a traffic disturbance, that's going to cause more hazards for you. So just be aware of that. Now, if you are um, arriving at a crash scene, automobile accident. Um, park 100 feet before or park after the crash scene, depending on the situation. And there's a picture coming up here in the slides that I'll explain that a little bit further. Don't park alongside the crash scene. You always want to be before it or after it. If you're arriving on the scene of a hazardous material uh, run, park uphill and upwind. So you always want to stay uphill, upwind, and um, as far as, as necessary away from those, those hazardous materials. Always leave your warning lights or devices on. So if you if you're still on the scene of an in, of a of a EMS run, you're always you're going to leave your your uh, your lights on. Um, that just lets everyone know that uh, you are on the scene of a of an emergency. And the other thing that that does is um, it, let's say that you get yourself um, into a, a position where you need help from the police. Um, so you walk into somebody's house and somebody um, you know pulls a pulls a firearm on you. And you call on your radio that you need uh, immediate assistance from the police. The police can, you know, when they get close to your scene, they can see your emergency lights uh, a little bit easier. Um, and then that, that directs them as quick as possible into the location of the emergency. Um, keep a safe distance between the emergency vehicle and the operations. So we don't want to park right up on our patient or right up on the crash scene. You want to maintain a, a good distance. 
All right, so here's that image that I was talking about. Typically, when you're responding to an automobile accident, you're going to be responding with fire companies. You're going to be responding with a rescue engine company, different fire vehicles. What uh, my recommendation is, and, and what what most providers do is is park the medic um, past the accident, and park the big you know fire engine or or, or ladder or rescue um, behind the incident. So in the event that a car comes through. Um, they're going to hit this large apparatus first, and that's going to deflect the blow of that uh, of that uh, you know intruding automobile. This also allows us to uh, take the patient from the 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 uh, the wreck and get them into the medic with the protection of that of that large apparatus in the way. Um, I see it every now and then where the medic stops short and the medic is placed right here um, before the accident. Um, the problem with that is, is now you're vulnerable when you're loading that patient into the back of the ambulance. You're vulnerable for all this traffic um, that's now coming this direction, coming towards the accident scene. Um, so that that makes it uh, makes it uh, challenging. So my recommendation is always pull the ambulance past uh, past the scene. Stay away from fires, explosive hazards, down wires, unstable structures. If you are responding as as EMS for a a, a fire scene. Um, you know, stay um, accessible, but stay out of the way. Um, set the parking brake, facilitate emergency medical care and rapid transport from the scene. So your parking um, at the scene should facilitate uh, rapid transport from the scene. So what I mean there and what, what we're talking about there is you want to be able to load the patient into the medic as quickly and efficiently as possible. So if that means you need to back the, the medic back into the patient's driveway, you know, that's that's appropriate. Um, line up your um, the access to the back of the ambulance with the front door of the house so that we're traveling the least amount of distance to get the patient from their house into the ambulance. So little things like that are important to pay attention to. Um, if it is necessary to block traffic, work quickly and safely. Don't block traffic for longer than you need to. Um, provide care and ensure that the scene safety is first. So as far as traffic control goes, um, traffic control is intended to ensure orderly traffic flow, warn other drivers, and prevent another crash. So you don't want to um, you don't want to uh, block roads just for the sake of blocking roads because that's a potential to cause another crash. Um, so you want to do these things um, conservatively. Certainly place warning devices on both sides of the crash. All right, so let's talk about the transfer phase now. So this is the phase at which uh, we're going to package the patient up for transport. So we've gone into their house, we've gone into the scene, wherever that may be. Uh, we've assessed our patient, we started treating them, and now we're determining that they need transported. So we're going to secure this patient to a backboard, scoop, scratch, scoop, excuse me, scoop stretcher, a wheeled amen stretcher, whatever we have, whatever the equipment that we're going to use. And we're going to secure that uh, patient to that, uh, to that device. We're going to lift the patient into the compartment, and then we're going to secure that patient with, uh, with straps or seat belts. Um, always use all safety devices. If you get into an automobile accident during your transport to the hospital and the patient was not properly secured, um, they have the, uh, the option to, uh, you know, to certainly hold you liable um, for their injuries because you did not secure them to the cop properly. All right, so as far as the transport phase goes, and when you're ready to leave with the patient, you're going to inform your dispatcher of uh, the number of patients that you're taking and what hospital you're taking them to. Um, sometimes, some places do, uh, require the beginning mileage of ambulance. Um, so that's dependent upon your organization. I know for most fire departments, um, we don't record the mileage um, as far as uh, to our dispatch center. Uh, mileage is all recorded um, automatically for us based on GPS. So you know, depending on where you work and who you work for, they may want your mileage. They may want, you know, like it says here, the number of patients. Certainly, you always want to give the uh, name of the receiving hospital. Monitor the patient's condition and route. As you guys know, stable patients every 15 minutes, unstable every five minutes. We're rechecking um, all of our assessments and vitals. Contact the receiving hospital. Um, in the central Ohio area, we do this prior to uh, arriving at the hospital, we call them um, over the radio and we uh, let them know of the situation that we're bringing into their hospital. And that's that um, hospital report that you guys have, have practiced.
It says, uh, don't, don't abandon the patient emotionally. So um, sometimes uh, I've seen providers that get into, um, get into the back of the medic, they get going to the hospital, and they just kind of stop talking to their patient. You know, they're calling the hospital on the radio, they're trying to finish up their report, all of those things are happening, and they forget that they still have a, a, you know, a patient in the back that they need to talk to. So be aware of the patient's level of need. You may just have to talk with them you know, on the way to the hospital. All right, so let's talk about the delivery phase. So this is when we're arriving at the hospital. You notify dispatch of your arrival at the hospital. Um, you report your arrival to the triage nurse or whoever is the normal arrival personnel at that hospital. So depending on the hospital, um, you, you may have to walk in and, and, talk and speak to the charge nurse first and say, hey, you know, this is medic so-and-so and we're here with this patient. Um, sometimes in, in a lot of central Ohio hospitals now, um, they have uh, large TV monitors um, when you walk in right at the in ambulance entrance. Um, and that large TV monitor has your medic number with the, uh, the bed that the patient is going to. So that's helpful. That makes it easy. You walk in. You don't have to really talk to anybody. You just look up at the screen. Um, you see where you're going and you, and you head that direction. We're going to physically transfer the patient. Then we're going to present a complete verbal report. So this is our, our EMS handoff. Um, we're going to do a handoff report to uh, the nurse uh, that is taking, um, taking over the patient care. So the nurse is going to come into the room, and you're going to release that patient to the nurse by giving um, a verbal report. Um, after that, you're going to complete your detailed patient care report. So most hospitals have an EMS room. Um, so after you've transferred your patient, transferred the care of your patient um, to, the, to the nurse, uh, you're going to go uh, head to that patient, uh, excuse me, head to that um, um, to the EMS room. And the EMS room is a, is a kind of like a lounge where you can sit down at a table. If you want to finish your report there, you can finish your patient care report. They usually have some snacks and drinks and coffee and other things for us there. Um, restock items if possible. Um, what I always like to tell people here is, it, in, let me take you back for a second here, in, in central Ohio, um, hospital, we don't use um, hospitals to restock our items. There are some places, um, Dayton, for example, the Dayton region, um, the in the Dayton area, all of the hospitals provide all of the equipment to the medics. Um, so they would restock at the hospital. Uh, in the central Ohio, that's not the case. In central Ohio, the fire departments and the EMS departments themselves uh, restock the equipment. So you can't really restock your truck until you uh, arrive back at your station. Um, so the, w what I like to tell people is uh, restock the uh, items into the, the bags or the kits that you may need to go into a scene with. So if you use something out of your first in kit or your jump kit, take that item out of the truck and put it in, you know, replenish the equipment into your, into your jump kit first. And then when you get back to the station, then you can restock the, the cabinets in the truck. Uh, so en route back to the station, inform dispatch whether you're in service or where you, and where you're going. Um, so depending on how far away you are from the hospital, you know, obviously if you work in the inner city, you're going to be in service right away. If you're working in an outlying area, you're going to not be in service potentially until you get back to your jurisdiction, right? So you're going to inform dispatch about all that stuff. Once you get back to the station, you're going to want to clean and disinfect the ambience and the equipment. You're going to want to restock supplies. Um, anything that you've used it needs to be restocked. Don't wait until the end of your shift. You should restock after every single run. All right, post-run phase. So after, after everything's completed, you're going to, uh, excuse me, after the run's completed, you're going to complete and file additional reports. You're going to inform uh, dispatch again of your uh, status, location, availability. So this is typically when you arrive back at, you know, at your station, um, you're going to tell them, you know, all right, we're back in service, right? You finish your report. You don't have anything else to do. You're ready to take your next run. Um, after that, you would perform routine inspections of the vehicle. Um, every now and then, you know, throughout your shift, it's a good idea to just take a look around, make sure everything's still in place, make sure nobody's tampered with anything. And then certainly refuel your vehicle if, if necessary. All right, so here's some different key terms relating to cleaning. Um, uh, cleaning is the process of removing dirt, dust, blood, or other visible contaminants from a surface. So 
Uh, cleaning is where you're just simply taking a, a soap uh, or a, some sort of a spray and, and just, just removing, uh, you know, visible uh, products from a surface. Um, disinfecting um, is where you're actually killing uh, pathogenic agents by directly applying a chemical made for that pur purpose. Um, so this is where you're going to use some sort of disinfectant spray, going to spray it on the surface, and you're actually trying to kill those, uh, those uh, pathogenic agents. High-level disinfection is uh, when you're killing pathogenic agents by the use of uh, potent means of disinfection. Um, so this would be uh, right now with, with uh, the COVID-19 crisis, you're seeing some, uh, some ambulances being what we call aeroclaved, where uh, they're taking a, a high level of disinfectant and spraying it into the back of the truck, something where you'd have to wear a respirator um, where you can't even, you shouldn't even breathe that chemical in. And then sterilization is a process uh, such as the use of heat um, that removes all my microbial contamination. So usually with sterilization, that's where you um, where you see something that's heated up uh, to a certain temperature to where everything is killed um, on that on that device. After each call, you should um, always ensure that you strip the linens from the stretcher, place them in a plastic bag or designated receptacle. Um, in Central Ohio, that actually happens at the hospital. So the hospitals do provide us with linens. Um, so at the hospital, before you come back uh, to uh, to the station, you would uh, strip the linens from your stretcher and place them in a plastic bag. Um, all the hospitals have linen uh, disposal, so they're blue uh, blue trash bags basically, and you would find one of those blue uh, those those uh, uh, receptacles that have the blue trash bags, and you and you dump the the dirty linens there. Discard any medical waste. Uh, and then wash contaminated areas with soap and water. You're going to disinfect all your non-disposable equipment used for patient care. So if you've used any item uh, on that patient that's not disposable, it needs disinfected right after, uh, after the run. Uh, clean the stretcher with a germicidal or virucidal solution or a 1 to 100 bleach solution. So some departments like using bleach. Some others have some chemicals that you can use. Um, some have uh, wipes, chemical wipes that you can use, um, but you need to clean the stretcher as well. Uh, clean any spillage or other contamination with one of those same, same solutions. So any sort of fluids in the back of the truck need cleaned out. Uh, create a schedule for routine full cleaning of the emergency vehicle. I know for, for uh, uh, my fire department, we use uh, Mondays as our deep clean day. So every Monday you're going to um, perform a full deep clean of the emergency vehicle. So every little nook and cranny is going to get disinfected and cleaned out. Um, certainly every day we, we clean every, you know, area, um, you know, the, the general areas of the truck. Um, but on Mondays we do a deep clean of, of every, uh, every possible place. Create a written policy or procedure for cleaning each piece of equipment. So if you, um, you know, if you add a piece of equipment to your truck, it needs to make sure that uh, you need to make sure that uh, that there's a, a method for that that um, item to be cleaned. All right, so we'll talk a little bit here about defensive driving. Um, an ambulance involved in a crash um, certainly delays patient care and may take the lives of EMTs, other motorists, or pedestrians. So. Remember, you're not only hurting yourself when you get into a, a, a crash in an ambulance, but you're potentially hurting your patient and you're potentially hurting um, the patient that you are responding to, right? Because you, you no longer can respond to them. You got to get another medic to respond to them. So uh, just keep in mind that, that uh, uh, getting into an accident um, affects very many people. Um, some states require emergency vehicle operations course. Uh, the state of Ohio does on the fire side, but not on EMS. So you won't have to take any. Uh, you won't have to take any uh, course. Some departments do require it. Some agencies will have you take some training, um, but just be be aware that the state of Ohio does not actually require uh, the course for EMTs. Um, some other characteristics of drivers uh, of ambulances: physical fitness and alertness. You always need to stay um, healthy and on top of your game. Um, ensure you're you know mature and stable. Um, and, and then ensure that you're operating with due regard um, for the safeties of others, for the safety of others and preservation of property. We'll talk about due regard here in a little bit when it comes to um, the, the laws in the state of Ohio. Um, speed does not save lives. Good care does. So there's no need to speed to get anywhere. Um, speeding does not save very much time. 
uh, and, it, and it really puts yourself at risk. Um, so we're going to always drive, drive uh, with due regard. Um, and then once we get to the scene, we're going to provide, uh, you know, as, as, as best care as we can. Wear your seat belts and shoulder restraints. We already talked about that. Um, become familiar with how the vehicle accelerates, takes corners, sways, and stops. Um, this is important when you when you start driving an ambulance. You'll notice um, that they they don't drive like your normal car. Right? They're a little top heavy. Um, they don't brake as quick. They don't accelerate as quick. So just be aware of those things and get comfortable driving uh, the ambulance that you're assigned to. Talks about staying in the left hand lane on multi lane highways. Uh, that's always advisable to stay in the left hand lane um, in case you do have to activate your emergency uh, lighting and siren. Uh, you know, the, the general public should be going to the right for lights and sirens. So if you're staying in the left-hand lane, that's that's best practice. Uh, so talking about a siren, uh, using the siren risk-benefit analysis of using a siren, the decision to activate the emergency lighting and sirens will be dependent upon um, local protocols, the patient condition, and the anticipated clinical outcome of the patient. So what that's talking about there is, is first off, you have to follow your local protocols. So your local protocols may determine when and when you can't use the sirens and lights. Um, the patient condition can have a big factor to that. So how stable is your patient? If your patient's not stable and it's allowed in your protocols and you need to activate your lights and sirens. Um, anticipated clinical outcome of the patient. Um, you know, if, if this patient, again, if, if this patient's having a heart attack, if they're having a stroke, um, they're actively having something where they could have a very poor outcome. It's important for us, you know, something like a trauma case, it's important for us to get to the hospital as quickly as possible. Um, the risk of using our light and, lights and siren outweigh, or excuse me, the risk of it, uh, excuse me, the benefit of using our lights and siren outweigh the risk. So there is some risk to using lights and sirens, right? It puts you at a, at a greater risk. Um, so just be aware of that and, and, and only use them when it's, when it's necessary. Always assume that motorists around your vehicle have not heard your siren or public address system or have seen you. This is very common. You got to drive defensively because um, it's more and more common every single day. Uh, I see people that uh, just aren't paying attention. They're on their phones. They've got their music up. They're eating in their car. They just don't pay attention. So uh, just always assume that every vehicle doesn't know that you're there. And if you drive like that, it's going to save you from getting into an accident. Um, they talk about a cushion of safety here. So maintain a safe distance uh, from vehicles around you. Avoid, try to avoid being tailgated from behind. This happens a lot when you, uh, when you take someone's loved one to the hospital and they're going to follow you to the hospital. A lot of times they think that that means that if you turn your lights and siren on, they can follow you right through traffic lights and other things. Well, that's not the case, obviously, as you're aware. So I always have to explain that to family members prior to leaving is if I have to turn my lights and siren on, do not follow me. Stay back. Follow all traffic laws. Do not follow me. Um, just something to, to think about. Ensure that the blind spots don't prevent you from seeing vehicles or pedestrians. Medics typically have pretty big blind spots. Those, those boxes on the back are not easy to see around, so just be aware of that. Never get out of the ambulance to confront a, dr confront a driver. Certainly don't let road rage get the best of you. It's going to be frustrating for you driving an ambulance, especially with your lights and siren on. Just give you some forewarning um, for that ahead of time. It's going to be incredibly frustrating because people are not going to follow the rules. People are not going to get out of your way. Um, just maintain a, a calm, cool presence and, and keep, you know, safely moving forward. Uh, it's unnecessary and dangerous uh, to use excessive speed. Um, it, it doesn't increase the patient's chance of survival. So, um, a smooth ride is better than a, a, a fa excessively fast ride. Um, it just makes it difficult to provide care in the, in the patient compartment. Um, it hinders the driver's reaction time and, and it increases the time that in distance needed to stop the ambulance. The other thing I see with excessive speed is, is what we call outrunning your siren. Outrunning your siren, and this is, they call it here, siren syndrome, um, it causes the dri drivers to drive faster uh, in the presence of sirens due to their increased anxiety. So if you're driving, uh, and then out, what I'm talking about with outrunning your siren, when you're driving fast, uh, when you have your siren on, it takes people around you a minute to realize what's going on. It takes them, 
you know, some time to realize that, oh, you're an ambulance, I need to get out of the way. If you're going too fast um, to basically restrict their ability to recognize what's going on, um, then you're going to, that's when you see people not reacting uh, properly. They're not going to the right for, for, uh, to get out of your way. Um, so that happens when you're driving too fast. Vehicle size and distance judgment. Crashes often occur when the vehicle is backing up, so always use a spotter. That's most uh, agencies' policies. If you're backing up, you need to have um, a spotter behind you. Um, size and weight influence the braking and stopping distances. So uh, these ambulances are big and heavy, so just be aware that it's going to take you longer to, uh, uh, to, to stop. I'm talking about cornering here, positioning yourself on the road. Um, you know, these are if you've never drop, driven a, a, a large van, a large truck, um, you need to recognize that when you're taking curves, when you're taking turns, you need to stay high in the lane. You need to stay up in the top of the lane and make a wider turn so that you don't cut that corner off. Um, weather and road conditions, ambulances have longer braking time and longer stopping distance, and that increases even more when the roadways are wet. That increases even more um, when the roadways are icy. Um, so just be aware of that. Um, be alert for hydroplaning, um, water on the roadway. Um, medics can, uh, ambulances can, can hydroplane at, at speeds as low as 30 miles per hour. So you could be going 30 miles per hour, which is fairly slow, and you could still hydroplane. Um, so just be aware of that. All right, laws and regulations. If you're on an emergency call and you're using your warning lights and siren, you may be allowed to do the following. Um, and these are things that are jurisdictionally uh, dependent. So depending upon the city that you're in, depending upon the state that you're in, some of these things might, might not be um, applicable. Um, I do have um, some uh, here in the next few slides. I do have some uh, Ohio laws that I that I brought into the PowerPoint just to kind of give you an idea of what we're working with here in the state. Um, you may so some things that you may be allowed to do park in a legal location so you know obviously if there's a street sign there that's saying you know you can't you can't stop there um, and you're on an emergency run obviously you can disregard that that sign that's it's not going to be applicable to you proceed through a red light or a stop sign I'll talk about that um, here in a second with with uh, Ohio's laws drive faster than the speed limit drive against the flow of traffic and then travel left of center to make an illegal pass all of those things are applicable in the state of Ohio but there's a big caveat to it and I'll talk about it here in a minute all right so if you're interested in this if you like uh, reading uh, laws um, and the Ohio administrative code if you look up 4511.03 that is the emergency vehicles at red signal or a stop sign law. And section A here tells you that the driver of any emergency vehicle or public safety vehicle, when responding to an emergency call, upon approaching a red, red uh, or a stop signal or any stop sign, shall slow down as necessary for safety to traffic, but may proceed cautiously past such red or stop sign or signal with due regard for the safety of all persons using the street or the highway. So, what that's telling you is, yes, you can run a red light. You can run a red light, but you must do so cautiously. You must do so with due regard for the safety of all persons using the street or the highway. So one of the things that people think when they when they start driving emergency vehicles is, well, I, could, I, I get to run the red lights, and then if I get into an accident, it's not my fault. That's That couldn't be further from the truth. You still have to operate with due regard. So what that means is, if you're going to run through a red light and you're going to move past that red light with, without stopping and there's a car that's coming from another direction and they're not stopping, you still have the duty to stop and let that person through. So yes, you have the, the right and the, it's a law that you can proceed through that red light, but not if there's another person who's not stopping. Now, are they breaking the law because they're not giving way to uh, an emergency vehicle? Yes, possibly. Um, but there's a possibility that due to uh, an obstruction or something else, they didn't see you. Um, so you have to drive with due regard. Um, so what that generally what that means is you have to be safer than everybody else. You can proceed through that red light, but you have to make sure that you can do so safely. All right, an emergency vehicle is never allowed to pass a school bus that, st uh, that has stopped to load or unload children. So 
the uh, and I didn't pull this law up, but there's a law in the state of Ohio that if a school bus stops, everyone must uh, excuse me, a school bus stops with their uh, stop sign and lights engaged. Everyone must stop and there's no um, exemptions to that. Um, so if a school bus is stopped and their lights in stop sign are engaged, meaning that they're loading or unloading children, you must stop your emergency vehicle. You're going to stop. You're going to my recommendation at this point is to turn your siren off um, and wait until that bus driver either waves you on or uh, or stop, you know, turns their lights off and, and retracts their stop sign. All right, the use of warning lights and siren you know, uh, must be on a true emergency call, so <clears throat> it probably goes without saying, but you can't just turn your lights on because, um, you know, you want to get back to, to have lunch or something like that. You have to be on an emergency call. Both audible and visual warning uh, devices must be used simultaneously, so you can't just turn your lights on. You can't just turn your siren on. If one goes on, the other has to go on as well while you're moving. Now, when you stop the vehicle, uh, you arrive at the emergency scene and you've stopped, then you can turn your siren off, but your lights uh, may stay on. And the unit must be operated with regard for other safety, and I talked about that with the with the Ohio law there. Right away privileges: emergency vehicles have the right to disregard the rules of the road uh, when responding to an emergency, and that's with due regard. Um, however, do, you know, do not endanger people or property under any circumstances. So that's people and property. So can't just, you know, wreck into cars or anything else like that. You've, you've got to have drive with due regard for people and property. Um, get to know the local right away privileges. <clears throat> Some jurisdictions allow you to uh, move into oncoming traffic lanes, but they restrict your speed limit. Um, in central Ohio here, Columbus, for example, um, I can drive in an oncoming traffic lane. However, uh, my our policy um, restricts me to um, 20 miles per hour when I do so. Use of escorts. Escorts are uh, act a, a, as a guide um, only when you're unfamiliar territory. So <clears throat> if you get somewhere, um, you know, you're, you're operating, you know, th this case doesn't come up much. This case comes up sometimes when you're operating like in a different state due to some sort of emergency. So hurricanes, um, you know, this right now with the with the covid crisis going on, there's a bunch of uh, private ambulance that have have uh, companies that have gone out to New York to assist. Um, they would operate with potentially with escorts. So maybe a police officer drives them, or, or excuse me, drives in front of them to the to the runs and then to the hospital because that person is familiar with the local area. Um, intersection hazards, intersection crashes are the most common and the most serious. Um, obviously, you you've got two vehicles coming at. Uh, perpendicular directions that are uh, potentially traveling at high speeds. You cannot wait. F uh, if you cannot wait for a traffic light to change, come to a brief stop, look for pedestrians uh, or other hazards. So it is recommended that when you do approach a red light that you do slow down uh, to a stop if you can and then look around and then proceed through the light. As far as highways goes, um, it says here, shut down emergency lights and sirens until you've reached the far left lane. It's actually po uh, policy here in central Ohio for us to not use our, our lights and sirens on the highway um, unless there's traffic impeding our flow. Um, and the reason there is, is that uh, you're not going to be able to travel much faster uh, than the other vehicles on the highway. And it just causes confusion when you've got your lights and siren on on the highway as people are trying to move over and 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 slow down and stop for you, um, it makes um, it causes more hazards. Um, so be aware of the policies. Um, you know when, when you get a when you start working for a company or or a fire department, as far as what their policy is for using uh, lights and sirens in on the highway. Uh, unpaved roads operate at slower speeds. Firm grip on the steering wheel. <clears throat> school zones, it's unlawful to exceed the speed limit. So similarly to the school buses, if you um, hit a school zone, you need to slow down to the speed limit at the school zone. Just because you're on an emergency run does not mean you can go faster than the speed limit in a school zone. All right, so this is the one, this is the Ohio law that talks about the exemptions to all traffic uh, rules for emergency and public safety vehicles. So it says sections, um, and there's a list of all of the sections that this applies to, and it's a majority of the traffic um, traffic law sections. You can look at this, you know, yourself, 4511.041. 
But anyways, those sections of the revised code do not apply to the driver of an emergency vehicle or a public safety vehicle if the emergency vehicle or public safety vehicle is responding to an emergency call, is equipped with and displaying at least one flashing, rotating, or oscillating light visible under normal atmospheric conditions from a distance of 500 feet to the front of the vehicle, and if the driver of the vehicle is giving an audible signal by siren, whistle, or bell. So you have to have, so what this is telling you is you have to have your siren on, you have to have your lights on, okay? And then you're exempt from, from those traffic laws. And then this last sentence is really, really important. It says, this section does not relieve the driver of an emergency vehicle or public safety vehicle from the duty to drive with due regard for the safety of all persons and property on the high, upon the highway. So if, if you're driving with your lights and siren on, again, you have to drive with due regard. You can still be caught at, caused, excuse me, you can still be found at fault for an, uh, an accident, um, even when you're driving with your emergency lights on. Um, so just be aware of that. You still have to drive with due regard. All right, distractions. Um, focus on driving and anticipating roadway hazards. Um, it's easy to be distracted as you're driving an emergency vehicle. The lights are going, the siren's going, um, you know, maybe you've got a patient in the back and, and, and the medics, you know, got stuff going or the, excuse me, the EMT, the medics got some, something going on back there. Just try to mem minimize those distractions. Got your, your uh, mobile dispatch terminal, which is your computer in the front with GPS. You know, if you have to shut the computer down, you know, shut the, shut the uh, screen down on the computer so it doesn't distract you. Um, it's your responsibility to focus on figuring out the safest route while mentally preparing for the call. Such situations demand your complete attention and focus. As far as fatigue goes, you need to recognize when you're fatigued or tired and alert somebody. If, you don't, if you're too fatigued or tired to, to drive an emergency vehicle, you shouldn't be driving it. So um, let somebody know, hey, I'm too tired to drive and, and follow your procedures there. All right, so um, we'll finish up the chapter here with air medical operations. Um, air ambulances are used to evacuate medical and trauma patients, two different types, fixed wing and rotary wing units. Not gonna talk a lot about fixed wing units because we don't deal with a lot of that around here in, in Ohio, um, but we do deal with um, rotary wing units, which are um, medical helicopters. Especially trained crews accompany air ambulance flights. Um, EMTs in your job as an EMT is going to be to provide ground support. So you're going to arrive on the scene. You're going to assess the situation. You're going to start treating the patient. Call for that medical evacuation. Call for that helicopter. Um, and then provide support when that helicopter gets there. Why would you call for a helicopter or a medevac? The transport time by ground is too long. So if you're out in a remote area and the transport time is, is too long for that pay, particular patient, it's a good idea to call a, a helicopter. If the road, excuse me, if the road or traffic environmental conditions prohibit the use of ground transport, so if the, if the ground, uh, you know, if it's, if it's an icy situation or snow and you, you physically cannot travel via ground transport, but helicopters are still, you know, operating, you certainly use, use that to your advantage. The patient requires advanced care, so if you're in an outlying area, and you're very far from a trauma center, you're very far from a stroke center or, or a, a cardiac center, and that's what the patient needs, um, you can call for that, that medical, uh, air medical operations. Um, multiple patients will overwhelm the resources at the hospital reachable by ground transport. So if you have a mass casualty incident um, where you've got multiple patients, uh, and there's a possibility that the hospitals are gonna be overwhelmed with that number of patients, then you should call for helicopters. What those helicopters will be able to do is transport those patients to different cities, right? So they'll be able to move them across the state um, to a hospital as quickly as you could drive them to the local hospitals. So, um, you know, patients with time-dependent injuries or illness, stroke, heart attack, injuries, uh, scuba diving accidents, drownings, those kind of things, trauma patients, um, candidates for limb replantation, burn patients, hyperbaric chambers, uh, venomous bite centers. So any of these specialized patients that need specialized type care, if the time, you know, is, is that if there's going to be a major time savings by using a helicopter, that's when it's appropriate to call for a helicopter. Um, so who do you call? In Central Ohio, you call your dispatch center. 
Um, we don't call helicopters directly. Uh, we call our dispatch centers and the dispatch centers then call for the helicopters. Um, there's multiple different companies, even in central Ohio here. Um, we've got uh, MedFlight. Um, there's also Survival Flight. And there's also Air Evac. So we've got three companies here in central Ohio that provide air medical operations. We rely on the dispatchers um, to find out who is the closest or who, you know, sometimes it depends on whose turn it is. If there's two companies that are the same distance, then they just rotate back and forth between them. Establish a landing zone. Um, generally, this is the, the um, um, responsibility of a fire crew on the scene. So if you don't have, a, you know, an engine company on the scene, typically the, the helicopters like to have um, an engine company that, that establishes that landing zone. And then they're there in the event of a fire or something that happens with the, with the aircraft. Um, they can assist with that. So if you don't have that on the scene, then you need to call for that so that they can set up that landing zone. Landing zones recommended to be 100 by 100 feet, 100 feet by 100 feet. So you need to find an area that's 100 feet by 100 feet. Maybe a possibility that you have to put the patient into the ambulance and drive them to an area where you can land the aircraft. Uh, so I know it's, it's, it's quite common, you know, if, if you're down in, a, in an area that's got a lot of hills and, and woods and forests, things like that, you may need to drive the patient to an area that's, that's suitable to land a helicopter. Make sure that the land is clear, excuse me, land is clear of uh, loose debris, overhead or tall hazards, obviously uh, trees, power lines, those kind of things. And then you're going to mark the landing site uh, using cones or vehicles. Um, you don't use caution tape and you don't use people to mark uh, sites. You also don't use flares. Um, the, the best thing to use is a traffic cone and you tip it over onto its side. As far as... Um, uh, non-essential persons and vehicles, all that stuff needs to be moved out of the way. Only this most essential things need to be in that area, that landing zone area. Um, communicate the direction of strong winds to the flight crew. So once that helicopter is en route, a lot of times those helicopters will um, meet us on a certain, um, you know, mutually designated radio channel, uh, communicate on that radio channel to the flight crew, um, the wind conditions, any overhead hazards, those types of things. Uh, keep a safe distance from the aircraft whenever it's on the ground and hot. So when, when call an aircraft uh, hot when the when the rotors are, are moving. So um, if that if the blades are spinning and it's on the ground, that's that's a, a hot aircraft, and you need to keep a safe distance away from that aircraft. Stay away from the uh, tail rotor and always approach the helicopter from the front. You need to make eye contact with the pilot and do not approach until that pilot signals to you that you can approach the, the aircraft. <clears throat> um, the main rotor blades of an aircraft can dip as low as four feet off the ground, so just be aware of that. Um, if you're walking up, that blade may be four feet off the ground. So if you're six foot tall, well, you can do the math there of what's happening if you come in contact with that blade. Um, here's some guidelines to keep in mind. Uh, do not, um, uh, again, do not approach the helicopter unless the crew uh, instructs you to do so. Uh, make certain that all equipment and the patient are secured to the stretcher. So you don't want any loose equipment because if the helicopter is still hot, if it's still running, uh, when you're um, transferring that patient into the helicopter, um, if you've got any loose equipment um, on your on your cot or the patient's not secured, uh, that's that's not uh, those items can can be blown off uh, and, and cause become a hazard. Uh, smoking, open lights or flames, including flares, uh, prohibited within 50 feet. Uh, and then wear certainly wear eye protection when you're operating near a helicopter. Um, here's some hand signals. Um, you know, just be briefly familiar with these. You certainly don't need to memorize this. We don't use these hand signals in Central Ohio. Uh, we do not. Um, the, the helicopter pilots themselves guide themselves in. Um, so just something to be aware of in case you operate in an area where they're going to instruct you to use hand signals. Some special consideration, night landings. Don't use spotlights, flashlights, or any other lights to help the pilot. The pilot does not need those lights uh, you don't want to shine those lights at the pilot because it's going to cause a distraction and glare. 
Um, so uh, the best thing you can do is direct low intensity headlights toward the ground. So you can illuminate the landing zone with headlights, but don't shine anything up at the pilot. You can illuminate overhead hazards or obstructions though. So if there's uh, a tree or power lines, something like that, shine a light on those uh, stationary objects so that the pilot can see them. Some issues that you may um, encounter, um, certainly assess the severity of the weather. It's not our call as the providers to determine whether or not the helicopter is going to fly, but just be aware of the fact um, if there's a massive thunderstorm that's, that's coming through your area, just be aware of the fact that you, you might as well not even call for them because they're not going to respond in that. Um, but it's not our responsibility to determine when or when they can't fly. That's the responsibility of the, the pilot, the flight crew. Um, because of the cabin's confined space, assess the number of, uh, excuse me, assess the number and size of the patients who can be safely transported. Again, that's up to the flight crew. That's up to them to determine whether or not um, that patient's appropriate. Uh, typical med medevac flights are extremely expensive comp compared to ambulance transports. Now, I don't don't typically like to uh, talk about cost and how that, because essentially we want to do what's best for the patient. In any situation, we want to do what's best for the patient. But do keep in mind that um, helicopter rides for patients are incredibly expensive. Um, so just, just keep that in mind because if you're calling a helicopter for a patient that you think doesn't need a helicopter, then why would you incur that cost on them? So call, call a helicopter if the patient needs a helicopter. But, you know, if they don't, there's no reason to do so. All right, let's go through some review questions. Uh, number one, all of the following are examples of standard patient transfer equipment except uh, A, Stokes baskets, B, long backboards, C, wheeled ch uh, stair chairs, or D, wheeled ambulance stretchers. And the answer there is A, Stokes baskets. So I, I mentioned that briefly. Stokes baskets are uh, what you see if you, if you ever have seen um, – you know, somebody who's, who's fallen down a cliff or something and they, and they pick them up with the helicopter, um, that patient's being secured in a Stokes basket. So those are typically used for rescue incidents. That's not a standard patient transfer equipment. All right, number two, the primary purpose of a jump kit is to what? Go ahead and pause the video and you can read through those answers. And the answer for number two is D, have available all of the equipment that will be used in the first five minutes. So again, that jump kit or the first in bag is everything you're going to need for the first five minutes to, to immediately manage any of those, those life threats. All right, number three, you've been dispatched to a call for an unresponsive patient. What is the most important information that you should obtain from the dispatcher initially? The callback number, severity of their problem, whether the patient is breathing, and the, or the exact physical location of the patient. And the answer here is D, the exact physical location of the patient. Remember I said you can't, if you can't find the patient, you're not going to be able to help them. So the most important information that you're going to get is where is my patient? Everything else you can figure out afterwards. All right, number four, while en route to a call for a major motor vehicle collision, the most important safety precaution that you and your partner can take is uh, adhering to standard precautions, um, ensuring the fire department arrives before you, using lights and sirens and being aware of other drivers, or wearing your seatbelts and shoulder harnesses at all times. So this is a good, um, you know, a good registry question. Always think about safety. So the correct answer here is wearing your seatbelt. So always think about safety when, when you encounter any questions like this. And so the safe thing to do is wear your seatbelt. All right, number five, which of the following is not a guideline for safe ambulance driving? You can go ahead and pause the video and uh, review those answers. And the answer for number five is C, Use one-way streets whenever possible. So that's not a guideline for safe ambulance driving. So A, always use your siren if you have the emergency lights on. Um, that is a, a good guideline. 
Um, always exercise due regard. So again, that is a guideline for safety, uh, ambulance driving. And then go with the flow of traffic. Again, that's a good guideline for safe ambulance driving. Using one-way streets, um, we're only going to use one-way streets um, if that's the only way to get somewhere. <clears throat> All right, number six, at what speed will the ambulance begin to hydroplane when there's water present, uh, present on the roadway? And the answer there for number six is B, 30 miles per hour. So 30 miles per hour is when uh, it's possible for, uh, for a medic, an ambulance to hydroplane. Number seven, the most common and most and often most serious ambulance crashes occur at uh, stoplights, intersections, highways, or stop signs. And the answer there for number seven is B at intersections. Just always be cautious at those intersections. Slow down all the way even to a stop, especially in what we call blind intersections. Blind intersections are where you can't see the roadway, um, you know, to your right or to your left. So maybe there's a you know, we encounter this a lot downtown where you've got a lot of large buildings right on the corner. Um, and those blind intersections, you really do need to come to a complete stop and then slowly move out into the intersection if you're going to uh, proceed forward. All right, the rec number eight, the recommended dimensions for a helicopter landing zone are what? And the answer there is C. 100 by 100 feet. So it should be 100 by 100 feet on a hard or grassy surface, a surface that is level, if at all possible. All right, number nine, which of the following statements about helicopters are true? And go ahead and pause the video. You can review those answers. And the answer for number nine is A. It is possible that the main rotor blade will dip uh, to within four feet of the ground. Uh, B is incorrect because the helicopter is considered hot uh, when the rotors are moving, not still, or when the rotors are turning. Um, C, if the helicopter must land on a grade, you should approach from the uphill. That's incorrect. You should rep uh, approach from the downhill side. So if the helicopter is on a, uh, on, a, on a slope, on a hill, Always approach from the downhill side. If you approach from the uphill side, there's a chance that those rotors are even closer than four feet to the ground. And then D is incorrect. Um, if you must go from one side to the other, the best way is to duck under the body. No, you need to, to walk out and around the front of the helicopter. Again, maintaining eye contact with, with the pilot. All right, number 10. Uh, upon arrival at the scene where hazardous materials are involved, you should park the ambulance where? Upwind, uh, with the warning lights off, downhill, or at least 50 feet from the scene. And the answer there for number 10 is upwind. So remember, always uphill, upwind. Those are the two things you want to think about if it's a hazardous materials incident. All right, and that wraps up chapter 37. Thank you.